everyone. Welcome to the Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. I'm Donia Koja. I'm Wendy Chang. And hope you enjoy this podcast about the March 2018 issue. Um, Wendy and I just offline were trying to figure out whether this was our fourth or fifth podcast. So it is our fifth. Time flies, yes, right? Yes, it does. She just told me it's the fourth. I'm like, no, no, wait, Wendy, wait. I think it's the fifth. We did mention how long we're going to be able to keep the count. I know. I know. I told you I can only count till three. <laughs> so thank you for being our listeners, and um, I hope you're going to enjoy this issue. I have personally really enjoyed reading it. I don't know how you felt about the topics, Wendy, but I personally have a lot of like um, interest in these topics. One is the gender and sex that we're going to talk about, but also there's elderly abuse and a whole bunch of other things that I find personally very interesting. Yeah, I think these are not necessarily what you think of as bread and butter emergency medicine per se, but really, really relevant. And truly, it is bread and butter. It definitely deals with what we see every day. Yep, it's just not very quote unquote medical right. in, in a way, but it is. So tell us what you think of these topics. I think that the most important part is that they start a conversation more than they actually answer a question per se. So please reach out to us, leave your comments or tweet at us. Um, You should be able actually now to go to the podcast app and leave your comments there too. Exactly. So we look forward to hearing from you guys. So let's start off with the first one, the first lesson. Um, which is uncivil union or intimate partner violence. So thank you to Drs. Heather Rossi and Lisa Smale for this topic. As you mentioned, Wendy, we face this pretty often. Problem is we don't know that we're facing it in a lot of cases. The lesson starts with a couple of cases the way it usually does. And then the first one, it's somebody who's coming in with just very vague complaints, a headache and back pain. She initially says that she's not being abused, but has like some red flags that we'll talk about later. And I think that that is what we tend to see pretty often, right. is not your flat out, hey, I was just beat up by my intimate partner, but sometimes that. So before we start talking about intimate partner violence, what does that refer to? Well, really, intimate partner is anybody that your patient may have a close relationship with. And so it doesn't have to be, let's say, the person is a, a significant other, husband, wife, a partner in the traditional sense, but anybody who you know they're emotionally close with or knows a lot of their personal information. So it could be anybody. That sounds very concerning. It is. I think that what we usually think of is, you know, a woman is being abused by her husband. That's, I think, the typical thing. And I like that the article starts with saying 10 million women and men in the United States experience physical violence, which is, one, a lot. But two, it also brings attention that it is not just women in that traditional sense. The article does have that wheel in it. Um, It's a power and control wheel. It's actually a lot more colorful and prettier than the original one that was published by the National Center on Domestic and Sexual Violence. And it talks about how... In this particular model, men abuse women with like male privilege, coercion, and threats. And what I find pretty interesting is it makes the assumption that men are abusing women in a heterosexual relationship, which is something that is not necessarily true or the only case that we see intimate partner violence. And I guess we're going to be talking about that later. How are we supposed to address this in our ED? I think a lot of EDs all technically screen for it. Maybe it's in triage, maybe it's part of the nursing screen about just general home safety, whether it's, you know, weapons or smoking or smoke detectors and things like that. And so there are tools for it, but we have to realize that it may not always capture everything. One, because maybe the person's medical issues are much more, need to be better prioritized. Or two, simply because patients may not disclose it. So you really have to have a high index of suspicion. What are you saying, Wendy? Should we as healthcare providers, physicians, NPs, physician assistants, be the ones screening for that? If you feel like nursing screening is not necessarily picking up everyone, do you think we're the ones who are supposed to do that for all of our patients? I think it is our responsibility. We are all part of the team and we all have to pay attention for these red flags. So what red flags are you talking about? So I think that that would make more sense, right, for me to look for red flags and then ask that question. Right. Because I find it just very awkward to just ask everyone out of the blue after asking them if they have chest pain, belly pain, trouble peeing or pooping, and then asking them, <laughs> well, 
are you having this? Then the conversation kind of takes a completely different turn. So what are the red flags that would make you start that conversation? So classically, we might think about multiple visits for minor complaints or maybe some delays in presentations or just their general behavior. Maybe they have a overbearing partner in the room and they feel uncomfortable in divulging their medical health, which gets to a different point because we probably should be evaluating all of our patients privately. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And that you bring up a pretty great point is that sometimes you have the spouse who wants to answer the questions for the patient. And I personally find that very intrusive and a huge red flag. And I actually had an issue once where I asked the partner to, to please allow the patient to answer questions. And the partner complained about me to the patient advocate. And I was like, but I am being a patient advocate by doing this. That is exactly what I'm doing. I'm advocating for the patient. Right. So it, it does become a little tricky with that. Definitely. Any particular exam findings that would prompt you to start asking questions about intimate partner violence, Wendy? Yeah. So we learn about certain patterns of injuries, whether it's ligature wounds or imprints of something like a handprint or a soul print, things like that. Bruises. Uh, we we're always taught that multiple bruises, also in areas where it might not make sense and how you might get a bruise, um, but we have to be so careful. not over bony prominences. Correct. Those are weird, right? They, exactly. I mean, I don't know about you, but I bump myself all the time, and it's usually against a boat, right? Correct. Your wrist, your knee. Exactly, yeah. But I think we also have to be careful of the fact that the patient may actually have a completely normal exam. That is assuming we fully undress them and truly examine them. Good point. Good point. <laughs> All right, so other than, you know, getting over how awkward it is and still asking the questions that you need to ask, asking the patient if they feel safe, trying to get a little bit more information and showing empathy, what else can you do? Well, really, it is providing a lot of resources for these victims, trying to figure out if they're, one, at the stage of ready to leave this abusive, violent relationship. If they are trying to figure out, you know, what type of shelter we're able to provide for them, how to do so in a safe manner so that they are not at risk for retaliation or harm from their abuser. So interestingly, here in the D.C. Maryland area, we have House of Ruth. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you knew that, but if you call House of Ruth to come and take someone and they think that that person is eligible, they don't let you send the patient there because they don't tell you where they are. Nobody actually knows where the shelters are. They get your address and they send you someone to take the patient so that, you know, no one would know where that person went. Right. From Kinda a safety like standpoint. Witness protection. Sort of. It's pretty similar. So um, I found that pretty interesting because I was just like, you know, very automatic. I was like, oh, okay, great. You're taking my patient. What's your address so we can get the cab to go there? And they're like, yeah, no, that's not how it works. I was like, oh, okay. It makes sense. The article makes good points of really the this patient victim needs a lot of things that you don't normally think about, like all their documents. Hope and the goal is that they don't return back to that particular environment again. So what if they're not, you said that these are the things that we can do for them if they are ready to leave. What if they're not ready to leave? I think that is a lot of times the tough part because a lot of these victims are not ready to leave this particular abusive relationship because of power forces that you were mentioning in that wheel. Uh, and so it might be financial, it might be because there's family involved. A lot of times with intimate partner violence, it's not just the two people. Specifically, it may involve children, it may even involve pets. I thought the article and the authors gave a great uh, example of language, because I always find that language examples are helpful for me personally. And they suggested, you know, you can say something like, should your situation ever change, I want you to know that we'll always be available to talk to you about it. Well, that's good. I think it, it leaves that open door to have the patient come back if they don't feel like they're ready. Whether it's because there are certain issues still going on or the power st struggle, they still have hope that things will change. But I think that's something that's very disturbing. I've heard this before, but I never really realized it was true, is that one third of the female murder victims are killed by their intimate partners, but these homicides often occur after the victim attempts to leave. Right. And that is when that abuser, abuser becomes just completely out of control and it ends up as homicide, which is very unfortunate and scary. So that's something that we need to keep in mind is that if the patient does not want to leave their abuser, we need to have a safety plan. 
So have a point person that they can call, mm -hmm. someone who's actually close to them. And as you said, have that bag that has some money and the documents so that if they leave, they can actually start off somewhere else. Because you know how difficult it is if you don't have any documents, you don't have a birth certificate, driver's license, and ID, you can't get health care. You can't rent an apartment. You can't find a job. Right. So how are you expected to, you know, start off this new life after you've run away from this person? Another thing that I find a little confusing, and actually I did a, a little research on that last night, is the reporting laws. A lot of states are against you having to report intimate partner abuse, and the reason they do that is because they are concerned that if you are forced to report it, then the patients are not going to want to come to the hospital to get the health care that they need. So it's kind of to protect them and allow them access to health care without the fear of being reported. However, the, uh, the exception to that is if you believe the patient is vulnerable, so let's say they have a cognitive delay or something of that nature, then that just completely crosses the line and it's not intimate partner violence anymore. It crosses into a different category. So it depends on what state you are. So for example, in Maryland, you have to report it if it's a gunshot wound or a moving vessel. Um, however, in other states, I'm sorry, in other counties in Maryland, if it's a lethal weapon, you have to, which knives would probably be included in that as well. So you definitely need to be familiar with what your state requires. You can either go to the, your state's health department. They usually have kind of a summary to tell you what it is. There's another document that was pretty interesting. It was published in 2010. It's the Compendium of State Statutes and Policies in Domestic Violence and Healthcare. And they have the details per state who has to provide screening, who has to report, what is it that you need to report. Those are great tips and resources, especially for maybe some of our new grads to figure out some of these regulations in their new home states. Yep. Pregnancy is a risk factor for violence, right? How would you treat patients differently? I was surprised to learn that homicide is also the leading cause of traumatic death in pregnant people. And so specifically, we do worry about traumatic injuries in the pregnant because if they did have direct trauma to their belly and they're in their uh, second or third trimester, of course, that has larger risk of injury to the fetus. So your cutoff is 20 weeks, right? Correct. Okay. Or the fact that if they have a serious enough injury that the physiological changes of pregnancy may mask some of our classic signs of shock, tachycardia, etc., that's because pregnant women are tachycardic at baseline, right? right? Yeah. And they have the volume expansion. Right. So they exactly. have more fluid to lose. Yes. See, I still remember. Yeah. I probably see pregnant people more than I do nowadays. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> There's that. That is true. And if we are worried about um, any sort of injury, we have to remember we have to observe them for four to six hours because of the risk of fetal injury. We have to put them on like a, a tachogram to make sure that they're not having any contractions. There's no signs of fetal distress, right? Okay. So not just like observe them in our ED, but they have to go to like a labor and delivery unit. Right, exactly. Okay. One part of this article that I really liked was that they discuss a very challenging aspect of intimate partner of violence, which is same-sex relationships. And I find this very difficult because one, patients may find it more challenging or more difficult to disclose that to someone because maybe they're afraid that their provider or their healthcare provider is homophobic. But also the other thing is the lack of resources. So the concept of shelters doesn't work necessarily as well because the whole idea of a shelter is that you are being taken into a, a shelter with the same sex as your assailant, if that is the case. Basically meaning that that person can actually just gain access as a resident of the shelter, which can be pretty scary. Um, I actually had a patient months ago, and I, I still remember him very well, who had come in and interestingly, he was actually pretty well known to the staff because he would come in all the time with cuts and there were just always knife wounds. And he was in a relationship with a transgender female who was at least 20 years older than him which was pretty concerning for a lot of coercion. And I think he was very financially dependent on her. And she would get violent. She would cut him. And he would come in very frequently for that. And it was difficult because we tried to counsel him. And he, what can we do? Right. There are no resources. I mean, we didn't have any resources or places to send him to. Exactly. There were no 
particular programs for this particular situation. And he ended up just going back to that abusive relationship. All these situations are challenging and awkward to deal with on both the provider's end and the patient's end, but I think that this just adds another layer of complexity because this is when you are even more challenged by the lack of resources. That's a great reminder that we really should be screening, looking for potential intimate partner violence in all of our patients, regardless of their sex or gender. That involves some of the red flags that we talked about in terms of in their history, such as multiple visits for minor complaints or coercive type of behavior with a partner in the emergency department. Uh, and also physical exam findings, like we talked about, patterns that just don't make sense by the mechanism of injury, defensive wounds, etc. Yeah, and remember that if your patient doesn't feel like they're ready, then discuss a safety plan and educate yourself about your own resources. And remember that all pregnant women above gestational age, above 20 weeks, definitely do need monitoring, no matter how minor you think the trauma is that they've been exposed to. Um, So along the same lines, actually, there was the LLSA article review about elder abuse. And I think that the most important, like, take-home point from that article, especially in light of the discussion that we just had, is that reporting is mandated of all elder abuse cases in all states except of the state of New York. Um, So remember that huge difference because they are vulnerable adults. So to slightly less grim topics... Um, The procedure that is discussed in uh, this month's issue is esophageal bouginage. I paused a bit when I saw that. (laughs) I I hear you. I'm like looking at that. I was like, is it a soup? Is it (laughs) a dessert? Um, It's bougie. Another use for our favorite tool in the emergency department. Exactly. It's a bougie nage. So what you basically do is that if somebody has an esophageal foreign body, you use the bougie to push it down. Like, how come I didn't think of this? Because then it could have been called the esophageal Wendy Maneuver. I wouldn't have named it bougie (laughs) but obviously I am not. (laughs) Well, I mean, I don't know about what you do on a regular basis, Wendy, but I don't think that you get bougies and shove them down people's throats often. You, That's you, not usually our intended goal no. of where, which passage to put the bougie in. I, I agree. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how that worked out. But anyway, so it's an interesting procedure. There's a couple of tips and tricks in there, how to carefully select your patient to do this in, because that's pretty much the key to having a successful bougie Right. So on to the next article or the next lesson in this topic, which is the gender gap. And it talks about sex and gender differences in the treatment of acute conditions. And thank you to Drs. Tracy Madsen, Lauren Walter, and Alison McGregor for writing this article. We talk about gender gap a lot in like employment, payment. There was actually an article that was um, published recently that talks that the pay gap in recently graduated emergency medicine grads is $34,000 between women and men. That after being adjusted for multiple factors, such as their patient volume, the hours that they work, and so on, which I found interesting. Anyway, what this article is talking about is not that kind of gender gap. It talks actually about the sex and gender-related differences in patient care. So how they present differently, how we treat them differently so that we're aware of this bias, and how these treatments that we do for them are actually affect these patients differently. And outside of this article, which is a fantastic resource, because it's a pretty concise summary of a lot of information, there is another resource, which is a website and podcast that's launched by Dr. Jeanette Wolf called Sex and Why. Um, It's sexandwhy.com. And she's from UMass. So thank you for that great resource. The science of sex and gender and how that relates to patient care has picked up a lot. So Brown has a sex and gender and EM fellowship where Dr. McGregor, one of the authors of the article, is the fellowship director. And not just that, but, and I'm quoting, the NIH is calling on scientists to take a deliberate approach in considering sex and gender in research to make sure that women and men get the full benefit of medical research. If you want to learn more, they actually have a bunch of free online courses. So as 
quote unquote non medical as this is because it's not how what we think of when we think of medical. I think this is pretty important and. You know what? If you don't know this, then you're kind of behind the world right now. So absolutely, I'm glad that there's definitely increasing attention to this because there are biological differences in diseases between sexes, as well as, like you mentioned, treatment differences, etc. Let's start with first things first. What's the difference between sex and gender? I know it may sound silly to some people, but but guess what? We don't do a good job explaining these things, so let's just start from scratch. That is very true. When we talk about sex, we're talking about the biological construct of sex, chromosomal differences. Okay. Whereas gender is a social construct. How someone may identify or express their gender; those are all more in the whole continuum of how gender is now being considered. I mean, some things are really obvious, right? So there's like, well, women have ovaries. So we need to consider ovarian pathology. And men have testicles. So we have to consider testicular pathology. In Epigenes presenting lower abdominal pain, right? Right. So those are like very sex exclusive. Right. Right. And it's kind of obvious of some sort that, you know, you got to consider these diseases that are sex exclusive to patients of different sexes. But what the article really targets is how regular, quote-unquote, conditions that are not sex-exclusive actually differ between men and women. Yeah. They talk about things like ischemic heart disease, CHF, stroke, medications, cardiac arrest, sports injuries. So we're going to try to take you through pretty much all of that. So what are some differences when we consider ischemic heart disease? I think that this is becoming a little more common knowledge is that women tend to present less typically than men. So for example, women can present with things like fatigue. I don't know if you've heard Dr. Amamatu say that before. He says, oh, with age and experience, I have learned to be very afraid of tired women, which... Good advice. <laughs> it is General. fantastic advice. Um, so that is something that we, have, we know. The rest of it really blew my mind. So non-traditional risk factors... Things like uh, lupus, migraines, and so on are actually more common in women. And we don't think of pregnancy as a risk factor, but it is. It's a risk factor for ischemic heart disease. Women have smaller heart masses. Therefore, there's a suggestion that their troponin cutoff should be lower. And stress tests are actually less accurate. I don't have time right now to rant about how stress tests are pretty terrible tests to begin with. Correct. But we know that their accuracy is roughly around 70% in men. And it's 60% in women. So basically just get a coin, flip it, and that sounds like a stress test. And it's a lot cheaper with, um, you know, less time. Right. The cause is also pretty different in women. So we know that it's usually a plaque rupture in men. However, in women, 1 in 8 or 12% are not going to be because of a plaque rupture, but things like dissection, spasm, toxubo. What is also pretty interesting is that women are treated less aggressively than men when they do present with ischemic heart disease. So it's not that, oh, we just miss all these people, but we find out that they have heart disease and they are less likely to get stress tests, cath, PCI, even really standard things like aspirin, heparin. It's crazy because the guidelines are exactly the same for both groups. That's scary. Are there any specific considerations for heart failure? So with heart failure, the way the heart failure progresses with women, they tend to, they're more likely to have a diastolic dysfunction. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or hif pif. They tend to also have higher resting heart rates and longer QTs, which means they're more likely to go into torsade. And if for whatever reason you decide to start them on Coumadin, they're at higher bleeding risk. How about strokes, Wendy? Because I know that that is, you know, one of the things that you like to talk about. So I think I'm starting to see a trend here because with strokes, women also often present with non-traditional symptoms. They might have pain, they might have altered mental status, and also they present with a lot more stroke mimics. So that makes treatment oftentimes difficult because you're trying to tease out which is which. Migraines and conversion disorders and so on. Exactly. Similarly, they have risk factors that are beyond the traditional cardiovascular risk factor. So like you mentioned, migraines, of course, we know about oral contraceptives. AFib is a more common cause of stroke in women. Even just a remote history of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia increases their risk of stroke. I don't think I have ever in my life 
ask a non-pregnant person if they've ever had gestational diabetes or preeclampsia. Definitely not somebody who's coming in when their youngest child is 20 or 30 years old with a stroke right. or stroke-like symptoms, but that's, that's enlightening. And similarly with strokes, women also are less likely to receive timely treatments, whether it's, you know, CTs or thrombolytics. Wow. Um, And there was an article on CBS News, and I'm just going to read it to you, right? Because I found that pretty interesting. Daniel Lackland, a professor of neurology with the Medical University of South Carolina, said he believes there is a real disparity between men and women when it comes to quick stroke care. Lackland suspects that wives might be better at detecting stroke symptoms in their husbands and pushing them to get prompt care. Quote, I think they may play a major role, Lackland said. It's not the male stroke victim. It's that the others doing what they're supposed to do and bringing the man in for treatment. End quote. Fascinating. <laughs> Maybe we need to focus on education so we need to educate men right. so they can call 911 for women. Exactly. Okay. I am yet to figure out how I feel about this particular news piece and how it's written, but, you know. This is to start conversations. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, please, tweet at us what you think. <laughs> and um, Wendy is as bright as her shirt right now because she's <laughs> laughing so hard. Um, so a couple other differences. I like to talk about this in elderly patients when I lecture. We don't think about how medications affect women differently. Now, women and men are different in their body composition and the way they clear drugs and, of course, their hormones. So we know that renal clearance is less in women. So whenever you do the Cockroft Galt formula or, you know, you just Google it, um, you're going to notice that there's a clicky that asks you if it's a man or a woman because it does make a difference when you're trying to calculate their GFR, right? Um, women have more of a fat content than men, percentage-wise, which basically means that if you have a lipophilic drug, then you're going to need a higher dose, and it's going to last longer. And if it's a hydrophilic drug, then you're going to need a lower dose because their volume distribution is lower. And that is why, you know, you have an increased risk of toxicity from things like digoxin, vanc. And then the other thing, which I find pretty interesting, is that women are historically underrepresented in clinical trials. So when you're doing a clinical trial to test the effect of a drug, you don't really know what it does to men and women. You know what it does to mostly men. Something that I find pretty interesting is that for Zolpidem, or Ambien, which is a sleep aid, the dose that was originally recommended for women is not really what it should be. It should be half of that right now because we have found that women have a longer effect with it, and it actually impairs their ability to drive even after taking it for eight hours, which is pretty dangerous. Right, absolutely. Other medications that we tend to use on a regular basis are like opioids, so women can get more analgesia and more side effects with the same doses as men. With paralytics, they require lower doses, they require higher doses of propofol, and they emerge more quickly. And um, men actually require more pressors than women, dose-wise. See, if we can just simply study medication effect differences, then it would already improve our patient care. I agree, because I think that what we tend to do is go like, oh, well, let me dose the morphine. Okay, well, if, you know, unless you want to give everyone the homeopathic two milligram dose of morphine to everyone, which I'm not sure, I can't even start with that one. But if you're trying to calculate it according to the weight, you're going to give it to two people, a man and a woman, who have the same weight, but you're going to end up with very different effects. Right. And then, of course, don't forget that with medications, when you're talking about a transgender patient who is taking sex steroids, then that's also going to raise another question of how that interacts with the medications that you're giving them. Absolutely. So how about cardiac arrest, Wendy? Again, lots of differences. Women are more likely to present with non-shockable rhythms and have causes that are not from cardiac ischemia, such as PE. They're also less likely to receive defibrillation if they were to have a shockable rhythm, PCI, targeted temperature management. Again, we're seeing a trend here. And what I found really interesting is that women actually are more likely to have an early withdrawal of care. And so bias towards some of the findings of maybe higher mortality from the cardiac arrest. I find that very interesting. And I just can't, with a lot of the things that we've been talking about, you can kind of wrap your head around it and sort of 
rationalize why it happens or I understand. I'm not saying that it's okay, but you can kind of try to make sense of it. But this one just blows my mind. Just to add to that, with pregnant women, it's just a reminder, if you have a female who is pregnant um, and undergoes a cardiac arrest, please consider perimortem C-section for cardiac arrest if you don't have ROSC within four minutes. So I guess this is just kind of a reminder that what we know in medicine is not necessarily accurate when it comes to women. All in all. Right. Definitely more research is needed. Yeah. The NIH is on the right track with that one. Right. I think kind of like the theme is that women present atypically, and we tend to give them less aggressive care for whichever reason it is, either lack of recognition of the disease, some implicit bias, and that the treatment we give them affects them differently. So educating ourselves, I think, is number one for us to start to make a change. Absolutely. A couple more things, as you guys hopefully know by now, since you've been following our podcast and reading Critical Decisions for months and months now, is that there are things other than just lessons. There's critical image, critical EKG, a tox box, a drug box. The critical image this month is malignant otitis externa. And the images in CAT scan are pretty interesting. Have you ever actually seen it in real life? Malignant otitis externa. That's that dramatic. I've seen sequelae of it. In the ICU. If you're like me and you have never actually seen an acute, like a truly malignant otitis externa, take a look at the pictures. They're pretty impressive. Yes. The EKG, the critical EKG, talks about EKG changes in cerebral disorders, which are deep inverted T waves and prolonged QT. And I think that the most important page in this entire issue is page 25, because it's a jungle out there. And please let critical decision in emergency medicine be your guide. Yep. And the podcast is going to be your guide. Correct. And then there's a monkey picture. But, you know, I'll just let that go. <laughs> With pink earphones. Other than that, on the last page, there's a tox box, which talks about the isopropanol, which is is in hand sanitizers and solvents, and that's your board question. Ketosis without acidosis. Absolutely. And finally, the drug box, which is a catabant for hereditary angioedema. Do you know how much it costs? A Wendy? lot. The wholesale price, the wholesale, like the Costco price, right. Right, is $9,600 yeah. per dose. That's not even what we charge patients. Exactly. Mind-blowing. Anyway, I guess that brings us to the end of our podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Wendy, for going through this issue with me. As always, it's always fun to read it with you, learn with you. Yeah. And talk with you. So don't forget, you can always reach out to us on Twitter, especially with this issue that hopefully is will generate a lot of discussion. My Twitter handle is at EM underscore NCC for EM Neurocritical Care. And mine is just a lot more boring. It's at, at Dania Kojo, which is my name. And until next time. Hopefully by then, winter will be over. Oh, God. Yes, hopefully. Hopefully.